Hi, everybody. Welcome to our This Week at Writers Chat. We're really glad to see everybody. We got a lot of our regular crew in the chat room. And if you're taking time to watch this on replay, we just say welcome, welcome to our community. This is a place we like to gather together as writers, talk about writing, all things writers, for writers, and by writers. And it's so much fun. We had fun just before we started recording, sharing some news and updates. And we always stay afterwards. And that's one advantage if you're live here. We stay after the recording finishes and we do some sharing sometimes answers some additional questions and uh it's just it builds a really good sense of encouragement support community as we all work together uh in this gift that god's given us this gift of writing and stuff we got a special guest today i am so excited <laughs> so excited many of us know her but i think Johnny's got us got to do the intro today <laughs> for, um, that way. so i'm going to send it over to johnny to introduce our special guest today. Well, I'm always excited to introduce our special guest for today whenever I get the opportunity. Um, I'm going to start out by telling you about a little girl who, when she was oh, no. years old, <laughs> had a stack of red cassettes. And each one of those red cassettes had a storybook that went along with it. And she spent hours with that a cassette player and listening to those stories, which had a bell, which told you when to turn the page. And, and these weren't just like one sentence, you know, to a page books. These were, you know, paragraphs to the page books with the pictures and all. And she loved those. And one day she was sitting on the couch with her mom and she didn't have the cassette player. She didn't have the cassette, but she had the book and she picked up the book and she recited that book almost word for word. And I, as her mom, <laughs> just sat there <laughs> stunned that this child could do something like that at her age. She loved books. She loved stories. She always has. And she's had a remarkable journey, um, which you know many of you are familiar with. She went to her first writer's conference. I tried to manage her expectations. <laughs> But I didn't need to because she came home with like two agents interested in signing her, a couple publishers interested in her project and receiving the Writer of the Year Award at that conference. And she's gone on to just do wonderful things for our writing community. And now, which just seems like a logical next step, she has recently become an associate literary agent with the Kyle Agency, which is C-Y-L-E. I'm not sure how, exactly how y'all say that. If you say the name or the letters, um, she's a multi-award winning author, a marketing strategist who earned top honors in her master's program where she earned her MFA in communications, focusing on marketing and PR. Bethany's motto is teach as you go. I don't know if I've even said her name, Bethany Jett. <laughs> her motto <laughs> is teach as you go, which she lives out as the co-owner of Serious Writer, a company that teaches and empowers writers and authors. She's married to her college sweetheart, my wonderful son-in-law, Justin, and together they're raising three teen tween sons, and they are all handsome, wonderful boys. I can just tell you that. And they have their cute little Pomeranian Sadie. So given all of that, we're going to turn it over to Bethany for this session, which is called Ask an Agent. So we've got some questions. We had a couple questions from Facebook, and she and I talked yesterday about a couple little things, too, to, to talk about. And then, of course, as you have questions, we, um, we want you to put those in the chat, and we'll be monitoring those to, uh, to make sure we feed them. We'll have time at the end where you can come on and ask questions in person. So, all right, I'm going to turn it over to Bethany. I am going to pitch it back to you in a second, though, because okay. I don't have the questions in front of me. <laughs> oh, okay. I did a um, screenshot, so I've got, I've got it. One thing we um, talked about yesterday, first of all, thanks for having me back. I love being here at Writer's Chat. I think it's, is it seven years? Is that what came up in our memories? Five or seven? It's, well, it's. It's something came up that was like seven years ago where we had somebody on, but we, that was not like our first episode. So it's, we're going like eight or nine years now. I don't even know how long. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's so crazy. always good <laughs> to be back with our writers chat family. And one thing um, along with the questions, um, my mom was asking if I could talk about 
would be Query Tracker and Query Manager, which is a program that I'm a huge fan of. And then uh, maybe even talking about Twitter pitch events, which is a place where I have found and signed clients. So the writing community on Twitter is a place I'm very active in. And so are several agents and um, some publishing house editors. So I really wanted this to be very much um, a way to do Q and A, so I'm I'm open to questions. I see some coming in the chat. And mom, did you want to start with the ones that came in earlier? No, or now, I, I or lied. I, I think I, I sent you the picture, and then I deleted it, so I'm having to to find it again. So if you've got one, how do you mark? Let's go ahead with Leslie's. How do you market yourself to an agent when you write in multiple genres? That's a that's a really good question. So. Okay, so I'm just my disclaimer at the beginning of this, so I don't, I think I'll repeat it every time if I don't just say it now, is that every agent works differently. <laughs> there yeah. are similarities, but um, the more I meet agents who work in these different genres from me, even some that we take the same things, I love hearing about their process. There's a really great podcast that I, I want to share, so um, I'll have to look it up on Twitter, but I listened to every agent interview they did and hearing their process was fascinating to me. So everyone is different. So I will just be trying to give you the general information and kind of more specifically me, because that probably will help you then with other agents too. So that's a disclaimer. So when you're pitching yourself to an agent, you're pitching one book or one genre. And so you're kind of wanting to show that you can market in that area. And the marketing is going to be different depending on the category. So for nonfiction, it's very important. Like I need to see the platform. I need to see why you're the person who can write this book and why people will trust you and buy the book with your name on it. Fiction is different. It seems to be a little bit different in the Christian market versus a general market on how important platform is. Um, sometimes it doesn't matter at all. And uh, some agents, it doesn't matter at all. Um, some publishers, obviously, they want you to have platform. So I tried to make sure even with my fiction authors that we are putting platform and marketing strategies in there, just in case it's between them and one other author. I mm -hmm. want the publisher to know that we've got a marketing plan. So I think that's really important. It's important for me, but not every agent cares about that. So you really need to do your research. And it, I mean, I've seen people say on Twitter that they spend 50 minutes for each query to an agent. I mean, they they put a lot of time into those. And so make sure you're doing your research because you're competing with people who are putting a lot of time into <laughs> the research of that agent too. Yeah. Um, and if you write in another genre that the agent represents, I would want to know that in the query because this book might not be good for me. But if there's a book that you've mentioned that you are writing in, I might be interested in seeing that, especially with picture books. Um, so a lot, sometimes Many times, many of the picture book authors will mention that they have other stories to share if I'd like to see them in the query. And the picture book that they're submitting may not be a fit for me, but if I liked them, I liked the story, I liked their query, they look like somebody I'd want to work with and I can see potential there, I have asked, please send me other manuscripts. I, this one wasn't for me, but I'd like to see more. So that does open a door for you if you write in multiple genres and the agent represents multiple genres. So. And if I don't answer a question well enough, I will not be offended for a follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can just kind of add to the whole genre thing because it is it is tough. It's a it's a tough question. Mm -hmm. But what you have, to, I think, what's important with fiction is that you focus on one thing first because the agent and that publisher is probably going to want that to be your start. But then it, it's once you start writing, it doesn't there doesn't seem to be that strict delineation. I mean, I, I've written in multiple genres and and it's not been a problem. So, you know, it just kind of depends on how, how God has planned your journey. But I think the important thing is to go in with one, one genre and say, yes, if, if, if it just it becomes a bestseller, know that you probably will be writing that genre for a while before mm -hmm. you can switch. And so both I, of you started out with just one genre. You both submitted just one thing and yeah. then it just branched out from there. So you two are both models of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For fiction and nonfiction, for sure. Mm -hmm. Right, right on that. And I know somebody asked a little bit more about Twitter pitch. So you might want to tell a little bit about what that is and how to get involved with it and the value of it, how you even do it. <laughs> yes. All right, so Twitter pitch parties 
happen throughout the year. So the very first step would be to create your profile on Twitter, update it, get it updated, and then start paying attention or using active listening um, by following the hashtags within the writing community on Twitter. And so some of the ones that I would recommend to start with would be the hashtag am querying, which is the word query, am querying. Those those writers who are using that hashtag are in the trenches. <laughs> they call it the query trenches. And so a lot of the conversations with that hashtag are being used with agents, with editors, with the publishing process, where if you search the hashtag am writing, it could just be people sharing their work in progress or, mm -hmm. or talking about writing in general. So if you're really wanting to kind of be in that pitching arena, the am querying hashtag is where I would start. And then look for hashtags even that are based around the genre that you're in. From my observation, because when I became an agent in July, I read the am querying hashtag thread every single day for six months and probably only missed a few tweets because I would read until I found where I had stopped the last time I would read them in order. Mm -hmm. So six months of following this hashtag has taught me a lot about what writers feel as they're going through this process, um, different agents, different editors, this whole kind of thing. And I feel like I got a, a semi-education in understanding the culture of writing beyond what I've learned as a writer myself, if with my own experience, and then also beyond going to a writer's conferences or even just within the community that I have started in. So that's my number one recommendation. Now, a pitch party is basically where some group or organization has said, okay, this day, we're going to use this specific hashtag and allow you to pitch your book to agents and editors. And there's always rules. So sometimes they're open to any genre. Sometimes they are genre or category specific. So just on the 26th, just this last week, we had um, kid lit pit. And usually the word PIT is at the end of every um, pitch event at to stand for pitch. So mad pit, which I don't think is a thing anymore. A lot of them have kind of died out. So kid lit pit just happened and they'll do it again probably in six months. So whenever you see that there's a pitch party that's going to happen, you want to go to the website or the main Twitter feed and then follow the rules for it. Because right now you only have 280 characters on Twitter for your pitch, but you have to use the hashtag. So that takes up some characters. Mm -hmm. And then they also recommend, and I recommend this as well, is using specific hashtags so that agents and editors can find what they're looking for. So you'll want to do hashtag, um, well, if you're doing a broad one, which was on the 25th, there was another pitch party for every genre. And so I was specifically searching for A stands for adult, MG is middle grade, PB mm -hmm. for picture book. So when you've got a big one like that with a lot of people participating, those specific genre hashtags are very important. If you're doing like kid lit pit, which I can show you if you want real quick, uh, the mm -hmm. screen I pulled up there, Twitter. All right, so you should be seeing oh, my wow. Twitter. Yeah. So um, like this one just happened, but I would follow them and then also check out their website because I think they said they'll do it again in about six months. And so I'll just kind of scroll down. Um, they did a lot of mini events, some of these groups, especially within the children's writing community. They will do, uh, well, actually DV Pit, which stood for, which stands for Diverse Voices Pitch, I believe, um, was a great um, pitch event as well. They will do uh, many events leading up to it where they'll have people do critiques of your pitch or let um, people who are participating critique each other to get ready for the day when the agents and editors are going to look at it. So some of the rules, let me see if I can find one on here. Um, okay, so what you'll see coming in here is they're retweeting. A lot of agents and editors are saying, hey, I'm zipping into the thread today. Here's where you can send me your story if I've liked it. So the rule is a heart is for typically for agents and editors. So as a friend of someone, you don't want to put click the heart on their pitch because that's reserved for specifically meaning interest from somebody who wants to actually get a query from you. Um, some pitch parties will let you retweet to show support. Some of them will split it where agents click the heart, editors click the retweet button, and then friends leave comments. So there's a lot of camaraderie that happens. You can still you see some more. Send the first 10 pages all of these things. I'm going to see if I can scroll down and see if I can find a, um, well, I won't do this live on here, but 
you can search this and you'll see people's pitches if you want some good examples of how to do them and some of the hashtags that people were using. I found as an agent, I always have uh, the website open that has the rules for the pitch event. So that way I'm, I can search better for like more specifically what I'm looking for. How do you find out when these pitch parties are? So they're always talking about them in the writing community. So I would say okay. get real deep um, on there because um, I'll, I'll see them, people start talking about like, this is coming up, this is coming up. There's a couple of people on here who put together a thread um, that had upcoming pitch events. And so I'll sometimes I'll mark that on there. Um, so the website for the Kid Lit Pit, which I'm not sure exactly is if the one, they're all different. So there's not one pitch party, it's groups coming in and creating them and they all have their own websites. This one is the kidlitpit.blogspot for Kid Lit Pit. Mm -hmm. which was great it was um it was it was a it was a great event yeah right. wow can you give us just can you just off the top of your head give us an example of what one of the pitches would be would look like the hashtag hashtag middle grade mg or something you know mm -hmm. i like the, so there's different formats you'll see some people will use emojis and then kind of give plot points um for their pitch which is kind of fun um there's mood boards. There's even a mood pit where people create in Canva images that relate to their pitch and then do a pitch. My favorite way of the, that I like to see is I like, I like comparative titles, books that are similar to your book. So I like to have title X title, which says, okay, my book is a blend of, or, or movie or show, but it's a blend of these two well-known things kind of gives me some idea of the boundaries where the book is. Um, and then I need to know the stakes. So for me, when it has the emojis and the plot points, that doesn't really garner my attention as much because um, I want to know what the main character is trying to get. My mom talks a lot about this in her fiction class. Like, what is the obstacle? What do they want? What happens if they don't get it? But you have to like really shorten that because <laughs> you don't have a lot of space. And then some of the hashtags, I was specifically looking for Kid Lit Pit. Um, I found myself searching for the hashtag um, I would do hashtag kid lit pit, the plus sign, and then the hashtag DIS, which stood for disability, looking for picture books with children with main characters who have a disability and that sort of, or the book is talking about that. So when um, an author used that hashtag DIS as part of their kid lit pitch hashtags, it, it let me filter out everything else and then just go through the list to see those because I was specifically looking mm. for them. Some categories, I, oh, God. No, I was just gonna say, I could see why you really have to educate yourself, spend some mm -hmm. time with it. Mm -hmm. um, for the one that happened on the 25th and the name of the name of the event is lost on me at the moment, but it was, it was broad, it was for everybody. So I was only, I only do adult fiction when it comes to like cozy mysteries, but they didn't have a category hashtag for that. Their hashtag was, I think it was MCT mystery crime thriller I think is what that stood for so thankfully some authors went ahead and put cozy next to their hashtag mct hashtag cozy so you are using multiple characters then when you are doing that but it helps because I I searched that specifically and I also found myself searching for books that I liked a lot that I was hoping would be a comp for somebody um so I just read a book that I absolutely loved and so I searched the hashtag um for the event um not, not Kid Lip It, but the other one. And then I searched the first few words of that title that I was looking for. And some people were using it as comps. And so then I was very interested in those pitches in particular. So um, I don't want to say that. I have a question um, yeah. because you are using, I mean, if you've got to use those, the, the hashtags and then your titles of books, I mean, that is just going to take up so much space. Um, does anyone ever, which would, this would not make it searchable for you, but does anyone use, um, like an image for part of their query. So maybe they put the hashtags and what's searchable in the tweet itself, but then <clears throat> an image with more info. I've seen what well, they call the mood boards. And so I've seen oh, somewhere okay. they'll put um, their image that they'll put there, they'll put enemies to lovers. So they may put the trope. Okay. Written into the mood board. Does that make like the, yeah, like that as the yeah. on top of the images? I missed that. Um, yeah. I, I like, I like the, the mood mood boards <laughs> it like kind of shows a it I think that would make it fun as you go through too that that would draw your eye so it is yeah we've got lots of questions I lots saw a bunch of of 
I know. Do we add a couple, Johnny, or do you want me to go? Well, back let can I let me do the ones that were on the Facebook thing because she did these right away, and then and then I won't forget to do them. Um, okay, I'm gonna say because all of these you kind of do together. What is the first thing an agent looks at in a book proposal? Uh, does platform matter more than the quality of the book or vice versa? And then does an agent keep clients informed as to where he, she submits their book or only if a contract is offered? Okay. So I'll cover the last one first and then I might have, I might need to be reminded. <laughs> okay. That's fine. Okay. So every agent works differently when it comes to this. I have to, I will disclaim on this one again. Um, I think a best practice is that, you know, where, what publishing house received it. I don't necessarily know that you're going to know the exact editor that it got sent to. I know for my clients, I have um, a Google doc for them and I send things out in rounds. And so as we're talking through their manuscript, I tell them how many rounds I think we can go for the book. And then I list the publishers that I send to, like we're in round one still for everybody. So round one publishers are here. And then I keep a spreadsheet with my list of contacts that has then all my clients there. So I can kind of look at a glance, like which editors have which projects from which clients. So not everyone has access to that, but each person is getting access to where the publisher that their book has gone to. They don't get to see the other thing. Um, I mean, because you should be able to know where your book got sent. <laughs> yeah, my, not know my agent do. does that. She sends an email, says, this is the list. You know, here's the list where, we, where we've sent the books. And then, then they yeah. let me know when they say yes or no. <laughs> And then if you, if we ever part ways, then you can, if you decide mm. to get another agent or whatever, okay, it went to these houses. So yeah. did I answer that one in full? Yeah, I think so. Uh, then the other one was um, the first thing you look at in a book proposal and does platform matter more than the quality of the book or vice versa? I think you can probably do those two sort of together. It depends. It platform depends. <laughs> it does. There's, a, it's 100%. So it, it goes back to the category platform matters for nonfiction because you can get a really good editor to tighten up your writing. So you don't necessarily need to be the best writer for nonfiction. Please nobody cut that out and like paste just that line. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, for fiction, the writing matters to me the most. Um, platform doesn't really seem to matter to me as much when it comes to that. And then for children's, you are marketing to parents and writing for kids. So it kind of depends. Um, I, I like to see a little bit of platform for children's writing just because it's so hard to break into that it makes it easier if I can say, you know, we can do all these marketing things based on this book or this idea. Um, and so many of my children's, I think I've, I've got four or five um, picture book authors and they all have multiple manuscripts and they're all deeply involved in 12 by 12 and SCBWI and critique groups. And they're all very invested in their writing careers. And it makes it a lot of fun um, for there. So platform depends. Um, and then I'm sorry, what was that other question? Uh, part the first thing, uh, you know, the first thing you look at in a book proposal, and I know I've heard you talk about this before that again, it varies by agent. <laughs> oh, this is definitely going to vary by agent. And um, it also varies depending on how you query them. So I use Query Manager, so this might be a good lead into being able to showcase yeah. what that is. I know a lot of agents who utilize Query Manager. It's a lifesaver, and I hope it never goes away. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let's talk about if you're emailing um, a book proposal to an agent, then it depends again on the category. If it's nonfiction, they're probably going to, you know, if they like your query, and then they open the proposal. Probably, I look at. I can tell you what I do. I if it's a nonfiction, I look at the query. If I like it, I look at the overview and then I look at the marketing and then I look at the chapter breakdowns. Um, I check out the comps and then I go to the writing. So that's sort of the order that I go in. I don't ask for a book proposal for anything except nonfiction because query manager, which is query tracker for the authors. And I'll show that it divides everything up for you, which is why I love it. So there's a place to post, like you can copy and paste your query. Then there's a place to pitch, um, you can put a pitch, you can put comp titles, you can paste your synopsis, and then all they upload then for me with fiction or for children's is the manuscript. The first I ask for 50 pages or the full manuscript for children's. For nonfiction, it tends to be a little bit more confusing because 
there's fields that you have to go through. So I think on my website, it says, or I'll tell people just put in a in those boxes and just I want the full I want an actual proposal for nonfiction, right? Don't require that for anything else. And it seems that seems to be pretty standard in the general market, maybe not so much in the Christian market, Christian market may want a proposal for fiction, nonfiction and children's when it comes through, especially into an email inbox. So I hope I didn't make that too convoluted. <laughs> But for fiction and children's, when it comes in, um, I look at the query and I don't really go to the synopsis until after I've read a little bit. And if I like the writing, then I go to the synopsis to see if the story makes sense and if there's an arc or sometimes there might be um, something graphic that happens. <laughs> Like maybe it's a little bit too much for me um, or maybe it's too high fantasy and I'm not really getting that feel in the early pages, but then later in the synopsis, I can tell like, oh, this is definitely more high fantasy than what I take. Um, so I look at the synopsis to kind of help me see if this is something I want to request further. So those are, they're all important, but they don't come to me or really probably many general market agents in the form of a proposal if they're using query manager to submit. All right. <laughs> okay do, were you going to show that or do you want to hold off on that a little bit and do some more questions? you want me to show it now yeah why don't yeah you? since we're talking about it okay so i'm going to show query tracker so this is the author side of it um it's free and then they have a they have a paid um premium i think it's like 25 dollars a month but you can do this for free and so i'm not going to like jump around too much but um basically you can search for agents based on genre and agents who are in here can open and close on their end so that it can only show you agents that are currently open or agents that are like even here right here these are updated these are the most updated recent ones closed they've updated their genre so you can kind of see oh you know i've been watching this person and now they're open and now i can query them um, it lets you track lots of things um, for on the, I, I would recommend going to Query Tracker and watching their tutorial videos because it's pretty fascinating, but you'll be able to see where your query is in a list on the premium side. And then it doesn't show you like any information about the other authors, but it'll give you a red line of distance from how, when, when you sent your query in to how long it's taking for it to be looked at. And yours will be in yellow and it'll show you green and red the ones around you so some people will show a screenshot of their query trackers and say i've been skipped <laughs> i don't know am i in a maybe pile because there'll be like tons of red above them and tons of red below them so they know they can see that the editor has worked the agent or editor has worked around their proposal but they haven't gotten to theirs so it does give information and then you can like they can go in and, and record the response that they got from the agent, like, or um, mark them as someone who doesn't respond. Um, really, really great. Um, I've got my version of it. So I use Query Manager as an agent. And um, I felt like this was a pretty safe screen to show because I didn't have anyone's personal information on it. <laughs> but it kind of gives me, um, so I get notifications. So what I love about it is it keeps my inbox free and clear for my clients, for my email and for editors. So um, all the queries go through this inbox. So this is kind of where I'm at. I've just closed the submissions because I'm trying to get through um, the rest of these. So it kind of gives, it shows my rate of response. But what an, um, a writer can do is they can see too if the agent is a fast requester or a fast rejector, or if they take five months to get back typically on average. And so that kind of gives you an idea of when to nudge or how long this person might actually take to get to yours. And um, yeah, I'm pretty fast and pretty slow. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so getting sick in November really pushed my stats and then the holidays, but um. So my fastest request time is zero days because it was after a pitch event and I opened the manuscript and I just said, yes, I want to see more. So that's why that's a zero. And then my fastest rejection was one day, which I try not to reject too quickly, um, but it's probably also after a pitch event. And then on my side, here's where my queries live and um, settings. So, you know, there's, it's a wonderful, wonderful program. 
the query tracker is the writer side. And I absolutely, oh, so if someone gets an offer of, I, ha, I received a notification this morning, someone has received an offer of representation and one of their queries is in my inbox. And so I get an automatic notification if, if they choose to do that, which means then I can click a link in that offer notification and immediately go to their query, which might be buried currently and pull it up so I can get back with them and let them know like, okay, you know, I'm actually interested in talking to you or um, what happens, uh, typically, if I I'm not caught up and someone has an offer, if it's not a book where I'm like, okay, I'm going to fight for this, some, uh, usually I'll step aside um, because they've already had the call with someone else who moved quicker. And um, But then I can let them know, like, best of luck, and, and I'll step aside for you so that you can move forward with your offer. But I, it's another feature that I love about it. That's amazing. Just amazing. I'm lost on our chat. <laughs> yeah, I got it. And I was talking and it was it. muted. It. Okay. I'm just going to okay. start going, going down from the get go. Okay. Um, how do you market and brand yourself if you write in your own name and a pseudonym? I did see that one. It's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling question. at that myself. <laughs> If you're writing under two names, you really have to have two online presences. It depends if you want people to know that that other name is your name or not. As to if you can cross promote, it's difficult. I'm not going to lie. It's, okay, that was it's my hard. question. So, okay. and, I asked, and I asked that because, um, like, some things I write, um, I, I just need, uh, you know, need a different name. But you know, I'm like, well, if you market yourself, you only have one face. And if you have to show up somewhere, what do you do with that? So I've like, I've been in like this big conundrum. So it's kind of like put a, 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 you know, a damper on what I've done or what I wanted to do. So, you know, I've opted more smartly to just, you know, use my own name, but um, variations of my name. So it's like never the same. I go with like B bro or Brandy bro, or if it's not fiction, Brandy S bro, you know? So it's like, great. I'm not ever going with my initials of BS bro. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, it's a lot of people have that question. You're like, if you write in a pseudonym, you only have a, one face and you need to market. And typically you're supposed to meet people and market your books. You know, what do you do with that? It's very difficult. Don't know. Just very difficult. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying that from experience because I, I write. I'm going to say that that you're saying that from experience. <laughs> it's difficult. It's hard. It's really hard. I don't recommend it. <laughs> hard, in other like words, really good reason to, do to it. be profitable and and get very far with that approach. Yeah. Yes. If you have to, if you have to create a persona from scratch, you can't utilize any of the platform you already have, which means you look like scammy because yeah. no one knows you or trusts you so if you are going to do that my recommendation would be spend that first 30 or 60 days giving incredible trustworthy content that makes it look like you know what you're talking about <laughs> it's hard <laughs> word of advice thank you well noted Sorry, I wasn't more encouraging. I, I no, push somebody actually, away from that. <laughs> no, no, actually, it just kind of um, solidifies my own thoughts about it already. So I, I really appreciate that. And there's probably several other people out there that have wanted the same thing and they want to write in this or like, you know, they write this particular genre and it clashes with this particular genre. So they choose two different names and then they wonder how to, what to do with themselves. So it's good to know. It, it is actually hard and not probably the best option. I think it's hard, even if you just choose a different name, like um, my friend Patricia Bradley. Bradley is not her real last name, um, legal last name. And, you know, so it's like, it's like even sending emails. She's got, you know, her Bradley email. She's got her regular name emails. And like, which one do I send this to? And and she has to make sure that that name is what it appears when she registers for like conferences or she's speaking. And And it was just a lesson to me when, <laughs> when I decided to change my name back to my main name. And this was, this was a lot of why, because it happened at the same time I was being offered a contract. They wanted to know what name was going to go on that book. Bethany was in the car with me. We're having multiple conversations with Pamela, who's also talking to the publisher and it's going back and forth and made that decision that if I'm going to do this, it's going to be legal. I'm only going to have one last name and that's, that's it because I didn't want to go through what I'd seen Pat had to go through with 
I mean, and it's just an annoyance. It's not like you can't do that. But then to add a whole nother name on top of it and not and not want anyone to know that's you necessarily, that's that can be tough too. <laughs> okay. Um I, I do want to add in one oh, thing. If yes, you want to change and write a different name because you write predominantly in have a protagonist that's different sex than you are and people are mistaking the sex of your character, um, then consider that maybe you need to strengthen your voice in that gen gender. Um, because if your voice is not strong enough, like if I write a male character and it doesn't sound like a male, um, that's the bigger problem than my author name. So yeah. just yeah. a, a, a note on that. Okay, so... Um... Pam talks about reading a blog about marketing and the trend is reels, but the article said it's only a trend. What do you think? Do you think reels are here to stay? I think short video is here to stay. And I think every platform is doing it differently. So Instagram has reels, TikTok is TikTok, YouTube now has shorts. And then we might see Twitter bring back Vine or a version of Vine, which was the actual OG, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> so, um, I think short videos here to stay for a long time and whether it's on Instagram as a reel or YouTube as a short, I think it's important to start doing it. And for Instagram in particular, they're prioritizing those videos. So that's where I would spend my time. If that, if your audience is there, obviously if your audience is not there, then don't, but short video is um, where it's at right now. Going back to pitch parties really quickly, is Twitter the only online place for pitch parties or are they happening on other social media platforms? I mean, there could be things happening in Facebook groups, but it's not as shared publicly as it is on Twitter. So Twitter kind of, from what I've seen, um, tends to be the place for that to happen. And I and I see agents uh, in there. I see editors, um, mostly editors, I would say it, maybe there are some big house editors there, actually. Um, a lot of smaller presses, too, even ones who may or may not require an agent. Um, some do. And so they'll say that I require an agent, which then if, but they'll like a, a pitch, which then you want to reference. And actually that's, um, so I've got my, most of my picture book clients found through Twitter and, uh, you know, they gave me a list. This person wanted to see it from this event. And I had a, a big five house editor reach back out to me after I sent her on submission. And she said, I'm so excited to see, um, I'm so excited to see this because I liked it on, whatever pitch party it was, which was four or five months ago. She was, mm -hmm. I love when they actually come in. And so awesome. I was over the moon. <laughs> <laughs> that email from a big five publisher, like not an imprint, like a big one. So I was so happy. I think this book is going to do so well, but I found her through Twitter. So like, I'm very much a proponent of, of being there. All right. And um now, you may have already answered this when you were talking about query tracker, but just to be sure, do you as an agent respond to all submissions or just those you're interested in? I respond to all of them, although sometimes it's a form, okay. which means it's not me. I did not add a personal note mm -hmm. to it, um, but I try to make my form rejection a nice one. Um, and I try to get to the point pretty quickly because it's not a fun email to get. And I, I try not to say too much, just kind of, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if it's, um, if, if it, so there's a difference between a query and a submission. So a, a query is I've queried you with this and the, I have not, the agent has not asked to see more. So those now with the load that I'm getting um, tend to be form rejections. There's just not enough time to go through them all. If I've requested pages, though, or if I've requested the full, which is right now is my practice, I don't do a partial. Um, so what you'll see is some agents will say, I want the first five pages, I want the first 10, I want the first 20 or the first 50. Those are the choices that they have to mark on there. And every agent's different. So that that's a complaint from writers is because <laughs> some people want to, I started off only asking for five, then I moved to 10, then I moved to 20. Um, uh, 50 pages is what they would consider a partial. If someone's, if you query them with 10 pages and they ask to see a partial, you would give them 50 at that point. Um, I just want to see the first 50 because sometimes the story doesn't start where I think it should. And I want to know. So, um, so I was requesting uh, one of my newbiness to this is I asked for not enough pages in the beginning, but then I was asking for the full manuscript. And then there is this 
sort of expectation, I would say, that you don't just send a form rejection when you've been sent the full manuscript, even if you didn't read it all. So I've been much more careful now with asking for a full manuscript because I want to give them the time or at least some sort of feedback with those um, because it does mean more than just the query. Or in a pitch party, if I've um, liked a tweet, I try then to make sure that I give some feedback if I'm rejecting because they didn't query me, I asked for it. So I think that deserves a little bit more respect than just getting a form rejection too. Some agents do that, some don't. Um, but that's kind of how I feel about it. Did that even answer the question? Because I think I rabbit trail out. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a real learning experience for you, I know. I mean, as you've tried, it, you know, that you didn't come in with, this is the way I'm going to do it. And that's it. It, was, it has been, I've seen you change different aspects of what you've done as you've gone yeah. along and, and learned, you know, first wanting just to do everything and then realizing that you just can't. So you had to sort of... Nope figure out a process that works for you uh, just it gives, a, a real, it gives us a real insight mm -hmm. too of what's going on on that side of the desk so uh, I appreciate that honestly well and I think with Bethany too having been on on the author side of the desk and still is like she knows how hurtful those <laughs> letters can be so, <laughs> yeah. like, Okay, I'm just going to do this message from Isabel this isn't a question but I thought it was interesting she says my because uh, Isabel's in France my Amazon page has two names in two different pictures. One is a pen name author, and the other goes for publisher and translator as the law requires in France. So that was kind of interesting. And other people are wanting Brandy to dress up in wigs and clothes and makeup and be her other second person. <laughs> she can have another persona. Um, okay, uh, Leslie, I have heard some authors querying before they write their book and they get contracts. Some authors do this only. I think it is better to have a manuscript written. Should it also be edited and ready to go? I've also heard there's a lag on contracts because everyone is behind about three years with publishing because of COVID. I'm trying to find that so I can. It's it. uh, well, it's down a little What's bit. What's the timestamp? Uh, 1038. Okay, good. That helps. Okay, good. I didn't even think to tell you that. Hi, Bitsy. Um, I'm looking for the question. I see it, but I'm looking for the, was that just a comment? No, there's a question there. She says, um, should it also be edited and ready to go? And she's just asking about the likelihood of getting contracts on a book that's not even written or is what, is what I'm reading into that. Uh, so again, it varies by category. <laughs> so nonfiction, two to three chapters. It depends on what the agent um, wants you to have for that needs to be written. The book doesn't have to be written though. And then for picture books, obviously the book has to be written. And for fiction, the book has to be done. So if, done. if I get it, yeah, if the query says, I mean, that's the expectation is that it's finished because um, my expectation is then if I request the full manuscript after seeing the first 50 pages and you can't send it to me, then you wasted my time, <laughs> literally. So because agents, zero dollars, <laughs> all of this work is for free. So um, you don't get paid for that. So that the time it takes is extensive, mm -hmm. extensive. And that doesn't count the work that you're doing with your actual clients. So no, you, if it's fiction, it needs to be ready. It needs to be as polished as possible. And I will say, if you're looking at a new agent who is building their list, because that was me just a few months ago, I was willing to um, take more risk when it came to a manuscript that might need editorial work on it. Now, even just seven months in, um, my list is pretty full. Um, it fluctuates. The list is also something that I didn't know existed until I became an agent. And I find it fascinating um, how the, your client list ebbs and flows. But um, my pickiness when it comes to those first few pages has heightened dramatically, which is sad because it means a lot of good books mm -hmm. don't make it through this process because the, the first pages weren't gripping. And that mm -hmm. is sad. Mm -hmm. That's also a sad thing about pitch events is because sometimes the plots and the pitch is everything that you want it to be. And then the, the writing doesn't kind of meet the expectation there. So you really got to nail those. 
I mean, you've talked about it so often in here too, why it's so important to get those first pages. Perfect. Uh, Dennis asks about, and, and I've got a question from Catherine, which I'll go back to you, but this is, Dennis is, is kind of on point what we're talking about right now, uh, about nonfiction with no chapters, perhaps like devotionals. So you would send just a, a sampling of devotionals, I would assume. Yeah. If they're short, I would maybe send three to five, give mm -hmm. them a spread. If it's a, if you're writing a book that is in sections, like that I would and there's a lot of sections maybe send section one so they can see how it goes kind of however you're wanting them to get an idea for how the book is going to be laid out send an appro that appropriate amount because you don't want them to say no because they couldn't see where it was going with devotions there's been I remember one they sent two devotions maybe three and the writing got a little stronger on the third devotion but they didn't send me enough and I couldn't trust that it was going to get better and so I had to say no you know, hate that. I do want to say one thing though, with query tracker, if you search for me, you won't find me. <laughs> oh, just throwing that out there. So, um, Patrick is the guy who runs query manager and query tracker. And so even, so for new agents, before they allow you to be seen on that main list, you have to have two publisher marketplace, um, contracts that have gone through. So it's kind of how he helps vet to make sure that there's not people just taking advantage of writers on there. Cause I reached out to him. I was like, I can't find myself. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And he said, no, no. He's like, this is what needs to happen. So as soon as that happens, let me know. And then we'll move you, um, visually onto that side, but you can still query me. I still have all access to everything I need as an agent to get query. So if you search for me, you won't find me, but th that's why though. And that takes time. So yeah. it could be two years before I'm visual, <laughs> but um, I understand why he's doing that too. And I actually think it's really smart. So cross your fingers, I'll be on there soon, <laughs> but you can submit to me through there, but you won't find me if you search for me. Um, I think it's also something else I've heard you talk about <clears throat> that we should say right now is that um, lots of times the, with the nonfiction, the publisher may only want to see the first two or three chapters because they also may have a, a slightly different direction they want the book to go in and they want to sort of help shape that proposal. So if you've written it all and then they say, well, we like chapters one, three, nine, and four, but the others we want to redo, you haven't gone to all that work. So, you know, that's yeah. a, that's another reason why with nonfiction, you don't have to have the whole manuscript done. They don't really expect you to because they, they're going to work with you for what, what the goal is there. I have I two things like to say you about have the table of contents. Do you, do you do the whole table of contents though? So you show them you have the idea for mm. or no? For the devotion? I not, not for devotion, for a, oh. for a regular nonfiction book. Yes. And I will say we had this happen with one of my clients just recently where I thought the book was too light. And I was like, I really think we need to push the word count up. And so we did in the proposal because she could stretch it easily. There's so much content there to put in. Um, the publisher came back and said, we love this. We actually would like it to be shorter, which is a completely <laughs> against my instinct. <laughs> so I wrote back and I said, well, what <laughs> actually is that word count? And I pushed her higher. Let me get back to you. So I reached out to my client and I said, well, 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 <laughs> and look what happened. Um, and she was like, oh, wonderful. So we, I said, so I reached back out. Do you want a new proposal? They're going to pub board this week. And like, yes, just send us an updated proposal. So basically we just changed the word count back to what it was originally. I resent the query crossing our fingers. It passes this week. So that does happen on nonfiction mm -hmm. and your agent can be wrong. <laughs> But the big thing is um, be easy to work with because my I love my client just like, I was like, I think we need to move it higher. Okay, yes, we'll do that. Okay, they don't want to hire. Okay, great. <laughs> just made it very easy. Okay, we've got one more question. And then we're going to, you guys can start popping back on. And if there's anything you want to say, we can do that before the recording ends. Um, so I'm Catherine asked, do you by any chance coach others who want to do everything and are going crazy trying? And I don't think you actually do coach others, though. You probably have some advice for people who want to do everything and are going crazy trying because you've written in lots of different genres, too, and or, you know, different kinds of writing. You've done ghost writing. You've done devotional writing. You've done um, what else? Scholarly writing. So just just different things. Lots of things. Lots of different things. So 
Yeah, as writers, we often just, we, you know, we have so many ideas. That's why so many of us can't stick to one genre, even in fiction. It's because we've got so many different ideas we want to do. So we want to do everything. We're going crazy. What is your advice to us? I would say pick your strongest project, the one that you think you can get your foot in the door with, even if it's not your heart project. Oh, Uh, that's hard, Bethany. (laughs) (laughs) I I know. (laughs) it is hard it is hard not your heart project (laughs) well there does seem to be well I can tell you with my authors there does seem to be some crossover that seems to be natural so when it comes to my nonfiction authors a lot of them can write children's versions based on the nonfiction book that they're writing as an adult. Mm-hmm. Um, there's possibility that one of my nonfiction authors who writes adult is going to get a children's book published first um, mm-hmm. because a publisher requested a specific book from her. So that might happen, <laughs> but she's not going to be pigeonholed in children's because she's working within the themes of what she's talking about. So that's why themes and really understanding for nonfiction, what your themes and topics are that you talk about is important because this was a request. So I don't, you know, we don't know if it's going to go anywhere or where it's going to go, but it's a possibility. So for children's writing, which covers YA, which that's a whole different story. I do not like that, <laughs> but it covers board books to, to YA, young adult. I think there should be a split there, but my picture book authors, some of them are also writing middle grade, which makes complete sense. So they have a lot of picture book manuscripts ready and done. And I acquired them on that but now they're working on a middle grade novel. And so just I had a client call last week and she pitched a couple of ideas. One of them I didn't really think was going to work too well, but one of them I got really excited about. And so now that one is kind of in the back of my mind, which is why it's important to tell your agent when you have other ideas, because I saw other pitches in the kid lit pit around the same story idea and kind of steered away from them because I know my client may in the future have this and I don't want her to compete against herself um, Mm -hmm. if it goes through. So always kind of having, I'm always thinking about my client's books. (laughs) I'm just curious, Bethany, if there's some insights into Mm -hmm. traditional publishing, the whole marketing of it right now, everything I'm seeing is that they're in turmoil, you know, between COVID and recessions and layoffs and strikes. That is- Paper shortage. Yeah, it is absolutely nuts out there. And then here we are all trying to feed into this system mm-hmm. with the idea, you know, we're not, we're, we're not going to be visible. We're not, you know, I know that's one reason why you have an agent. I know that, but it seems like it's harder now than it was five years ago. Can you I would agree give us a, a insight or comments? Mm-hmm. Well, the HarperCollins strike... Let me just look. I think we are still on strike with HarperCollins. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I've been following the HCP union um, group there. And so um, myself, along with, I think there were, t- um, I know that there were over 200 agents that signed the strike pledge to support the um, editors out there. I'm not sending to any HarperCollins imprints at all. No. So um, that's something, that's a conversation I'm having with people as I'm onboarding them. Like, look, I think this would be a good, I think it's a good project. I just want you to know, I'm not sending to HarperCollins right now. They're still on strike. And uh, that eliminates a good handful of places where it could possibly mm-hmm. go. So you have um, exactly what you said. There's an entire <laughs> big <laughs> house with lots of imprints that are on strike where submissions are not going out to them, which means that the other houses are now kind of receiving probably mm-hmm. more um than normal there the layoffs that are happening is incredible the paper shortage <laughs> I mean like paper is expensive and there's a shortage of it so it, it it is harder now too and I think that the the need for um the own voices situation right now where they don't want you writing um a story where you can't, you're not representing like the main character. I think that also, if you're writing fiction can help eliminate some of the places that you can be sent to. Um, you, you may not, like a lot of the houses are wanting books with things that you may not agree with. So then you can't be sent to those. I know for the Christian market, it's a very small, small pool of places to send. 
And typically, like I mentioned, um, three rounds, two rounds for proposals, Christian markets, mostly two rounds for my authors. And I try to go a little bit wider with that first round. And if it doesn't go anywhere, we'll move into a second round and then the proposal's dead yeah. for us. So it's hard right now. I think we're going to watch publishing shift. And then we didn't even talk about, um, and Jeannie, you mentioned chat GPT and okay. Kyle did a whole thing on it in our um, serious writer club too, but that's AI is also going to change the way this works. So one thing that, that he said that I, I agree with this, I think we're going to ride this wave, but I do think there will be a desire for human written books, which will be something will actually now be said <laughs> that it was written by a human. <laughs> um, and the creativity that comes from that, I think that that will come back to maybe be um, a come on, like a, a, something that we, people want and are looking for. So that's good. And it means that if you, um, and Kyle said, like for editors, they can put material into chat GPT and then take a basis and create something great off of it. And that actually is very helpful. I did a, I've shared a thread in uh, today about 10 ways to use chat GPT for research and tweets and all marketing. Yeah. And I mean, it's very helpful, but um, a lot of people are very resistant to if they find out that the book has been written by AI, like that'll be a problem. So I think we're going to see a lot of people try to do that and not get away with it because it's very limited right now, but and it's a new area legally too. We don't even know mm -hmm. what's going to happen legally. Right, that. all the lights. Well, that's happening. <laughs> Lots happening on that way, but that gives us a peek. I know we're at the top of the hour, so we can invite people to come on back in if they want to. If we've taken you off, a couple of you people, <laughs> kind of, we may have taken you off, and you're in writers' chat jail. You try to come back in, and you can't. If you want to come back in, just please put it in the chat, and one of us will release you on that. We try to watch the chat at this point when people come back in and stuff. I know Dennis asked about a series. How do you tell an agent that you've got a series, or how do you do that? How do you propose that? Okay, so my recommendation for a series right now is to let them know that it could be part of the series, but make sure the book could also be a standalone because um, the there's a lot of risk in contracting a series, especially right now. They're going to want to see how that first book does. So it's good to know that there could be more, um, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't end the book in such a way where you have to go into book two. Mm -hmm. To have a satisfying ending um, that tends to work well if you're doing um indie or hybrid publishing where you can control the release of that second book um and you're kind of packaging them in a certain way that might be a good strategy on the traditional side uh, i have to say no to those so it could be a series like devotionals where a devotional could stand alone I, that was a dentist question and i know he writes devotionals but it could yeah. then, but you just say, this is also part of a larger theme of yeah. this. I could add this and this to it and that. So they would stand alone. Maybe that helps. I call it a series potential or a line extension in the proposal, letting them know like, okay, this is what the, the bigger idea here is. Um, I do include that in the nonfiction proposals. Johnny, I'll let you wrap up in a minute, but while we're still on recording, I'll talk about what's next week. Okay. Uh, Alyssa, but I think it's going to be kind of exciting. It's going to be the launch party lessons. And uh, Brandy, you're here. I think Brandy and Melissa, and it seems like there's Melissa. Do you guys want to talk just a, briefly about what it's going to be? One of you two? <laughs> We're both looking at each other. I know. <laughs> I haven't talked about it. I'm for that today. So, okay. <laughs> But it's going to look at your lessons that you learn by launching books, right? The hard lessons. So, yep, that, that, that'll be exciting. Johnny, you want to wrap up? Uh, yeah, uh, we're really glad. Bethany, thank you for being here and answering questions. We're going to hang out a little bit longer at the after party. Um, we are so excited for today's show. We're glad for all of you who were here and for who participated by asking questions. I hope you got some great answers. Even if it wasn't the answer you might have wanted, <laughs> we invite you to come back next week. We also invite you to join our Facebook group, Writers Chat Members. Check out our Facebook page and you can see all the episodes that we've done. We were talking before the um, 
before we started this episode that we've been doing this for like, we don't even know for sure, like eight or nine years now. And we don't have all of our episodes recorded, but most of them are. And if you want to join us live after watching a replay, we are here every Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock Central, 11 o'clock Eastern, and you are more than welcome to join us. You can find the information in the Zoom link and the password in the Facebook group. All right. I think that's everything. So goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next week. Great. Bye.